everyone, and welcome to Oz by Drone. I'm Greg. And I'm John. Hi, everybody. Hey, guys. How's everything going? It's good to see everyone here at this strange time. And yes, it's an hour earlier for those people who are not in Sydney, Australia. For us, it's the same time, except it's not because the clocks change. But it's all automatic. It used to be such this big panic thing that everyone had to go and change their clocks, but nice and easy these days. Yeah, not everything's automatic. I still got to run around the house and do all the manual ones, you know, wristwatches and wall clocks and stuff. But I do like the fact that I'm, I'm confident now that my uh, my you know, phone or uh, or tablet will fix it up. I used to worry about that. I used to set them up. Couldn't wouldn't believe that it would change over. Then something stuff up. Anyway, here we are. We're, we're here on time. Happy days. Happy days. So while we're doing um, some happy days comments, is the chat thing not showing up? So just resize that shot to my daughter over there, our producer. It's not showing up on the screen. Anyway, while while she's doing that, it's time for... The news. Da, 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 da. Here we go. There's the music. Budget. We've got, got a very, very big show today. We've got so much stuff happening, and we've also got some breaking news. <sighs> We have the little drone that could. So this drone's been sent to our show from the wonderful Ken Heron. So thank you for that, Ken. Thanks, I'm actually Ken. gonna I'm gonna quickly unbox it now here as we speak live and see. And what, while you're doing that, give his show a plug already. I'll give his show. Ken Heron, is there is there any show that needs not to be plugged? Yeah, everybody knows his show. Yeah, so Ken Heron has Thursday Night Live, which What is it, mate? Is it might be a pigeon. You never know. <laughs> did you? Did, what did you do with that pigeon that attacked you? The Ken attack pigeon that was oh, there a while it, back. Well, I went back to um, my pigeon. Went back to Victoria. It was a homing pigeon that lost its um, home point, and uh, yeah, it lived in Victoria. Would you believe? And I heard another pigeon's gone haywire. So who knows? Apparently, pigeon navigational uh, issues are going on because they mm -hmm. seem the, the homing pigeons don't seem to be homing. And I tell these guys, you know, you've got to set your home point correctly if you want the pigeon back. That's They're for sure. They're probably afraid of jerky. <laughs> they probably are. Is it a pigeon or what is it? I can't wait to see. What are, you, what are we giving away? So it's not a giveaway per se, but this is a DJI Spark sitting here. Oh, lovely. That's, so, a, good, there's a, that's a beauty. This is um, something pretty special. So this is a drone that's getting sent all around the world from one place to the next to the next. It's a DJI Spark, and it's going to be auctioned off for charity. And we've got spots for about 10 people to um, autograph these this Spark as it goes around the world. And yeah, um, yeah Australia yeah. is the first place. It's here. I've got a controller as well. So um, I've got to find a time to fly it. And unfortunately, I've been looking at the weather map, and it's not looking too good. <laughs> So we're going to fly around the world, are we? Spark around the world. On one battery. On one battery. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, anyway. I hope you think how long it's going to take, but, yeah, it's going to take another couple of days to get out of here until the weather lifts, that's for sure. And you know why I know it's going to be on one battery? He sent me a charger that doesn't plug into our PowerPoints. Oh, there you go. Boom and tish. Oh, that's going to be great news. We'll look forward to that. Maybe we can get up a, a world map uh, set up on the internet so we can follow it around the world. Yeah, going to be a, we're a going to track it. It's going to be an auction at the end. There is the opportunity for people to contribute to the shipping costs. So yep. if you go to Ken's show and Super Chat there, we don't have Super Chat here, so go to Ken's oh, show. Shipping and, uh, cost? I thought the thing flies. <laughs> it does. It's an airship, Bumtish. Okay, good. Anyway, News time. So let's get started. Before we do start, though, thank you, as always, to Jeff Sills. Um, he does some great stuff for us um, in putting this together. So go to dji.retroroms.info slash news. Yep, but fantastic. let's get started and have a look at this first clip, some paragliding. Oh, yeah, this is a great clip. Nice sunny day. Paragliding along, looks like a great sight. Oh, oh Sir Daisy, Co collected in the in the shrouds there on the right hand side. Look at that. The guy keeps his cool. Look, doesn't even flinch. He just plans his approach. You know, no, no real drama. I like the way he handles it. Actually, can't hear much swearing. Oh, good. He's just gonna he's gonna bring it down. 
Look, we just thought we'd share this because it's um, an important message. If you're flying near someone else, especially someone in a manned craft, whether it be a paragliding or paramotors or whatever, um, talk to them. Yeah, if you hit him, um, if you hit him in the head, kind of hard in the back of the head, it might have a, a much more you know nasty result. Um, yeah. And also, you wouldn't want to collapse the chute if you're flying an Inspire or something. An Inspire maybe maybe uh, damage the shrouds. I'm not sure whether it goes through it, but look, he's untangling it nicely. Good fella. Um, yeah. You know, no damage done. But um, again, you know, that's that's just one of the uh, risks you got to take up, guys. If you're going to fly in that area, good one to remember. But if you're flying near a slope like that and the wind is coming onto the slope with uplift, there's a good chance that anything can fly. If the wind's going the other way, then um, you, you won't see people flying there. But in slope conditions, in, in just like you'll find gliders, paragliders, hang gliders, everything, and a lot more bird activity because birds like to soar in Absolutely. that area as well. So um, just think, look at the wind direction and the, and the terrain and you should get a hint. I will say in this case, the guy knew who it was. So it was someone who was doing some stuff together, filming, and, you know, he lost situational awareness, um, especially if you're flying with other people around. Having yeah, yeah. a spider under that kind of a circumstance, absolutely essential. But let's yeah, move on. Yeah, might have been filming. Good stuff. All right. Here so we go. The we've got yep. the Ryder Cup, and we've got a tethered drone doing security surveillance in this one. So we've just got a photograph on it. Yep. A tethered drone built by Elista Air was used by the French authorities to ensure continuous aerial surveillance of one of the biggest international sport competitions, the Ryder Cup, held in Paris from September 25-30. Now, uh, the Elista Air is a, a, a French-designed aircraft. We've had a look at them, actually, and they're quite good. The, and what I like about the Elista Air stuff is they've got a very nice tether that seems to um, have some of the things that uh, people get wrong in them, um, getting it right. So they're not cheap. Um, you know, you look, you're looking at about 25 grand for something like that. You'll pick up the tether alone for about 12 um, or so. But, uh, uh, you know, the Elist Air um, aircraft is designed to be tethered and they've got interchangeable cameras. Um, it won't run two cameras at once, um, uh, anything like that. And apparently you can use their tether on a matrice um, which is nice as well, just the smaller ones. But, um, yeah, good company, worth checking out, and we're going to see more and more tether uh, solutions in the future, um, particularly ones that, you know, once they're set up properly, they offer some amazing possibilities. Um, Absolutely. For, uh, yeah, for <clears throat> aircraft. So that's good. Yep. And, well a relate, and a related uh, late news story that we've just heard from the FAA that um, um, they're looking at this particular tethered solution and looking at what they're going to be doing in the US. So they saw it and they saw the, the aircraft and um, being done at a golf course and thought, they thought to themselves, well, these golf balls, we've got to get ADSB on the golf balls and we've got to make sure they're all registered and the pilots have <laughs> got to get a part, something or another certification. So... Yeah, the FAA is definitely all over this. And I tell you what, golf balls are risky, and the public is often within 30 metres of a golf ball. I tell you what, they fire them straight at you. you know, and what can you do? You know, there's there's um, probably a, an argument that it's quite a risky, um, you know, there's quite a hazard there. And you're not supposed to engage in activities that create hazard to other people. So golf, I mean, you know, where are we going to start? Look, we do joke about it, but in all seriousness, um, you know, there have been zero deaths from drones. There have been, and I did a bit of research just Googling around, seven recorded deaths on one website from golf balls. So we do joke about it. Um, obviously, that's been over a longer period of time, but nevertheless, yeah. interesting yeah, golf, stat. Golf balls can be lethal. Um, yeah, I, look, it, it's all it does is it invites you all the time, guys, when, to think about risk and what you're doing. And that, that really is what good airmanship is in these aeroplanes. There's not much to, to uh, op operating them and flying them and so forth, but if, you, if you've got a good eye and, and head on your shoulders for working out risk, you won't have any problem. You'll have a long and happy flying life. So, uh, and, and if you're playing golf, that's it. Uh, golf's out for me now. Too risky. I'm finished. <laughs> Absolutely. And I pressed the wrong button, but it's still the next title in the news anyway. We're looking at Lank. Yeah, this is a great uh, uh, thing that the Americans have got going. Federal Aviation Administration has given nine companies permission to fly in controlled airspace. Now, that's not the companies, the operators. These are the aircraft companies. 
uh, which is really interesting. So uh, what they, what we're going to see there, one of those nine companies is DJI, along with Aerodyne, Airbus, Anox, uh, Altitude Angel, Converge, Kitty Hawk, US uh, Kick and Un- Unifly. Um, it doesn't mean operators can fly those aircraft over airports anytime they want, though it means that professional drone pilots can now get authorization uh, in a controlled airspace in near real time instead of waiting for months. Now, when I went to Canberra and spoke to the head of air services down there, uh, rather embarrassingly, uh, this was, um, Lank was being trialled at the time, and I asked, um, you know, uh, Simon whether, you know, the, F- the air services had looked at Lank for Australia, and he wasn't really familiar with what it was. Um, it's pretty simple, and one of the reasons that DJI uh, have been approved for Lank is because of their geofencing and um, and the way you need to register um, your aircraft if you go to fly uh, in um, geofenced areas. You can get a license, of course, to, to to do that, and that works pretty well. I mean, you know, I know you can break jailbreak your airplane to do it, but if you if you're a commercial operator, you don't need to. You can write in, and DJI will give you a, a thirty uh, a ninety day license. Um, a 30 kilometer radius uh, you can unlock the area um, and uh, off you go um, you know, but link is a, a system that works with the national airspace system in America and all you do is you log in um, and pretty much straight away if you're in an area that's outside the approach path to the runway uh, you might be with inside your five kilometers uh, your three miles but but uh, based on the day, circuit direction or whatever it is you can get a low altitude authorization so you might be doing a roof inspection up to 30 meters uh, or so very very low risk to the manned aircraft and you can get that approval to fly in inside the controlled airspace they know you're there uh, they've got your details your mobile phone you just call the tower once you've got your approval and it just saves the faa so much um, you know, uh, you know what I'd love there. to hear, though. You know what I'd love to hear, and I haven't done any digging yet. Does the um, uh, the app talk directly to FAA servers, or does it go via the DJI backend? And do you need an unlock license no, in addition to that? It's it's separate to DJI. So Link is a system where you register an operator, registered operator, say with your ARN yep. to, to go, and you've got a, uh, a internet access, and you basically go log in, and and off you go for the the actual flight you want to do. So it's got nothing to do with the airplane. You would need to put the airplane probably the type of airplane you yep. identify the airplane. Well, it's white, uh, blah blah blah, mark, just usual stuff that we use to identify aircraft and a contact number, the most important thing. Um, I imagine in some circumstances you want VHF, but I've found a lot of, um, you know, air services and tower guys don't want us on the radio at all. They'd rather we weren't um, and just listening rather than uh, talking on the radio. So the telephone's much easier yeah. um, for the support staff to manage. And looking at the space, um, you're looking here, if you actually check, click into the article um, that, that's there, um, I think it's in our comments section, um, just the amount of the size, 2,000 square miles near airports may, that maybe uh, benefit from these operations can now have access um, for commercial operators. So it's a, it's a good step forward. I really hope we get a system like that here. We need it. I um, hope so. My only yep. disclaimer is I hope that it's done in such a way that it's app directly to regulate it, not via yeah. China and not via somewhere else. That's my only oh. hope. Yeah, good luck with that. Anyway, I think it's uh, the way it's planned is the other way. So at the moment, it's China. Yeah. Okay. So we got a rescue um, um, story. Media, uh, a media beat up, you decide. A recent rescue of a fisherman stranded at the rocks on the Gold Coast Seaway was delayed by a drone. Helicopter rescuers had to wait for the drone to leave the skies before the injured fisherman could be winched to safety following a boating accident. Apparently, everything turned out nicely. But, of course, the helicopter was on the ground. Um, and the operator may have not known that there was a helicopter there on the ground sitting somewhere waiting to take off. So misunderstanding, I don't know. I mean, if the guy was actually filming um, a fisherman in distress, I think that warrants, um, uh, you know, the possibility of a helicopter arriving. So maybe he didn't choose the Mm. right decision to fly. Um, this is, this much I do there. know, having having done a little bit of research on it, he was apparently filming the helicopter, but apparently that's where his focus was. Was he aware of a fisherman in distress somewhere nearby? I don't know. Well, he, he can't be filming a helicopter, man. The, the separation rule is if it's la- If it's on the ground, he's filming the helicopter on the ground from his drone in the air. Sorry, that different story. Uh, in flight, it's 1,500 metres or 500 feet vertically. 
on the ground, um, he's only got the usual SOC. Um, 30 metres. Can't, can't damage property. So, yeah. Well, 30 metres from people, but also, you know, not in a way that's going to damage property. Correct. So, yep, no problem. Well, it'd be interesting one to see how that played out if it was. But at the end of the day, they're going to argue, uh, you know, that if he was aware of the helicopter and aware of the fishermen, then... You know, put if two he's and two aware together. of both of them, you've got to put one and one together. Absolutely, but yeah. if he's not aware of the fisherman, then yeah. the helicopter guy, all he's got to do is start up his engine. As soon as there's obviously an intent to take off, then he's got yeah. to go and land his drone, and yeah. that would have been a yeah. really simple solution. Moving and on, the, and the argument, just to finish up, Greg, the argument mm. here for everybody who is a recreational flyer is that that's a, it's a privilege to fly at you know, some of the places we fly. Don't stuff it up. Don't muck that up. If you you think, oh, I think I'm right, I didn't cause it, just forget it. Don't do it and and remember that, that the reason that we've got the privileges that we have in this country is that we're kind of mostly getting it right. There's still plenty of cowboys out there that are flying above 400 feet. We know that and also in the wrong place. But, you know, do the right thing and let's keep flying. You know, Absolutely. Let's, not, let's not have our privileges taken away. Absolutely. And from there we go to a story about graffiti. We've got a video here and there's some talking at the beginning, so I'll just um, get you to stay quiet. I know you won't be able to hear it, but let's have a look at the video. This is the Paint Copter. It is a DJI Matrice 100 platform with custom modifications. The spray gun is mounted on a pan tilt unit with the pan tilt unit on the end of an arm so that the spray is not affected by rotor wash. The onboard battery has been replaced with an external power line. The modified electronics have been positioned at the rear of the UAV to counterbalance the weight from the arm and nozzle at the front of the UAV. Paint is supplied via an external paint line and pressured air line. The use of external power and paint enables extended mission times suitable for industrial painting tasks. The onboard sensors are an Intel R200 real sense for depth sensing and the Zurich Sense S360 Visual Intertial Camera. There are two onboard computers for real-time processing. A Jetson TX2 for GPU processing and an Intel Upboard. So look, long story short, really, really cool drone. It's um, based on a Matrice and um, got the external paint and power line so it can be tethered. And um, this was created and built by the Disney Labs teams. Yeah, so, look at that. Certainly they're not want, really wanting to use it for graffiti. Um, but the, the interesting thing, and I've cut that video down so much shorter than the original, but the drone actually has some really advanced GPU technology that can go and do a 3D map of the surface that they're going to paint onto first. Then they go and build the model of what they want to paint onto it and um, really, really um, some cool tech that Disney's looking at there. Well, yeah, that's something, isn't it? Never thought of that. Absolutely. And one more quick story. Jailbreak. This is a classic. <clears throat> I love I love this. We've got to watch this. I was watching this last night. Here we go. Play this one, Greg. These guys are fantastic. Here they are. So the story is... These guys were going to send some drugs into a prison. Well, you start there and you know they're stupid, but how stupid do you get when you leave the camera running while you're actually putting the drugs into the drone? And so that's the, that's the uh, phantom camera there, and they've got the airplanes on, and the, the thing's recording, right, for whatever reason, it's recording, and... The well, memory they, card's in the drone. Memory card's in the aeroplane. And then when they crash it on the other side of, uh, of the prison wall, which they do, they, they just take the guys take the card out. So there they are. They're, that's the evidence that you'd play in court. It's got their car, their address, their street address is there. Um, you could probably pull the G GPS location of the house off there because it was booted there, even if it had a, a vague... Um, you know, because they take it outside, so it would have got a GPS lock. I mean, you cannot imagine how much information these guys flew over the wall with their drugs. It's just fantastic. Look, look at it. Here they are outside of the car. Oh, it's just great. We got the Kinder Eggs there, you know. Yeah, Kinder Eggs. They're sending their stuff in. Um, 
So as, you, as I've mentioned before, we, we work um, with a company called Merwin Partners and, and they've got an aeroscope system at Park Lee Prison uh, and a few other places as well. But we do the testing for it. So every six months we do an audit and we have to sneak in and, uh, and drop stuff in the prison. Fantastic job. Best job of all. Uh, <laughs> as, as my young son, Tom, uh, our uh, chief pilot, tells me, it's just the best. And um, we do. We, get, we have a bit of fun. But looking at those processes and how you get in, um, and trying to do it properly, uh, unless you've had a good look at the site and you know what you're doing flying-wise, it's actually a hard thing to do, um, to do it at night and get a, get a successful drop. And stupid, of course, but that's a classic, man, to, to have the footage on the aeroplane and have the SD card um, is great. Yeah, dumb and dumber, as Bob Brown has said there. So let's yeah, move absolutely. on. absolutely. Let's move yep. on. And at this point, wrong button again. There we go. There's the right one. Yay! We've got a guest. We've got Mick Malloy coming to join us. Fantastic. This is and going to be great fun. We'll just get his audio on on the bottom line there. There we go. Hey, Mick, how are you doing? G'day. How are we going? Good, good. Mick, thank you for coming and joining us. Mick, um, the, the topic that we're going to talk about is the UAV Challenge. Tell me, what, what was your involvement in that particular event? Um, so I've been on the – for this competition, I was a judge. Um, for the main competition, the medical um, uh, express competition. And, yeah, I've been involved since the first one in 2007. So, uh, yeah. Okay, 2007. So it's been running for a little while then. Yeah, running a long time. It's probably one of the older UOV competitions in the world. Okay. Hmm. And what's your background in um, drones and aviation in general? So um, I'm an aircraft engineer, uh, aircraft maintenance engineer. Um, started at Qantas many, many years ago on 747s, 767s. Uh, moved into design and um, repair, so engineering side of things, so um, MRB engineering. And then um, design of unmanned systems with defence okay. uh, from, the, from the maintenance side of things, so not the air vehicle design, but, but uh, maintenance interfaces. And that. My, my background's maintenance. And then um, aviation quality management, so... Um, it's sort of what I've been recently doing. Okay. Look, mm. just for those people who are watching us from outside Australia, we're just going to put the video on now. So we've got a quick clip about the challenge. Mm. Outback Joe is a right dummy. Every year he gets into strife and needs rescuing. Actually, it's a good thing that he's a right dummy and gets into strife. He doesn't like to talk about it, but he's a superstar of the world's biggest UAV rescue mission competition. The UAV challenge takes place in a stunning location in Queensland's rural heart of Dalby on the Darling Downs. The competition is in two parts. We have a high school competition where teams drop an EpiPen to Outback Joe, who's lying in a field. And then we have the main competition for adults, which is called Medical Express. That happens every two years. It's incredibly tough. Teams design their own type of aircraft. And of course, there are lots of crashes. Each year we deliberately make it tougher because we don't want people to end up like our friend here. We want to help people and save lives. It's like Mission Impossible. As well as extreme weather and attacking birds, we also make it harder for teams by introducing simulated obstacles like other aircraft. Above all, it's a lot of fun. It's very exciting and teams have a great time. a nice tagline there you'd be a dummy not to miss it so tell me um the 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 actual challenge who who came up with the idea originally so um you saw in that ad um professor jonathan roberts him and another gentleman uh, the late rod walker um came up with the challenge in the back of a taxi i believe the story goes um uh, they were with csiro and qut um, yeah. And they, they came up with it in, um, I think, about 2005, 2006, and it took a fair while to get up and running. But, yeah, so the first, as I said, the first challenge took place um, in Kingaroy in Queensland in 2007. Okay. So we'll just put a couple of photos up. We've got one quickly. Oh. There we go. So do you want to just talk through some of these? We'll, put, we'll maybe make them full screen, make it a bit easier. So these were from the drone expo. So that was at, so in in uh, the Dolby Drone Expo. So in at 
the same time as the challenge, um, the township of Dolby had a, um, a drone expo, put it showing off mining and agriculture drones. So this is a hover map, like this one. Um, mm -hmm. It's through CSIRO. Uh, that was that one. The previous one had a lidar and it autonomously flew in underground mines, so GPS denied area, tracked itself in the walls with the lidar, and then autonomously flew inside the mine. This one was Canberra UAV spare aircraft, so uh, quad plane or octo plane. So that's their backup, one of their backup aircraft that they actually entered the competition in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, that was on display. And then yeah, this photo I like because you can see the little spark down there. and uh, Sorry, the little um, teller and you can see how small it was. Compared to the um, other one, yeah. Yeah. So this is Team India, um, Team Dashka. That's their, they're a hybrid. So they run a ga an internal combustion em engine running a generator. So one aircraft goes up and acts as a relay and the other <laughs> one goes down and flies the mission. But really long flight times, in four <laughs> hours. Yep. This is a pilot's briefing. This is one of the Polish teams, again, with a um, quad plane or octoplane design. So you mentioned the Polish team. We've got a fair few countries involved, I saw. Yeah, so lots of teams involved. So there was three teams from Poland, um, uh, Canada, Thailand, two from Thailand, the Netherlands, India, Australia, um, lots of teams. And, that, and also in the high school competition, we had teams from the USA, Australia, South Korea. Okay. What do we got here? Uh, that's the um, the Dutch team. Um, that's a, so basically it's a helicopter frame and it takes off um, vertically and then transitions to flight and then that's the little target. So they have to print an A2 target mm -hmm. um, that the team look for and they need to land within a certain distance of it. So Outback Joe is our rescue guy. He would get here, print this, put it on the ground and the aircraft's going to come and land here. So each okay. team had to supply one of those. Yep. And that's to give you an idea of size of some of the aircraft. That's, that's me standing in front of them <laughs> <laughs> with my judging sheet. So, and there you go. That's the, um, the other drones out there. So you can see the size when they're quite large. They are indeed. Nearly, nearly 20 kilos. We've got a couple more, I think, or is that it? No, that's it. Mm. Um, so, so talk to me um, the, the event. So there's two sections. There's the initial one, and we've got nothing on the screen. So there's the Airborne yeah, Delivery right. Challenge. That's open yep. to high school students. Um, yep. It's done at the base. It's within visual line of sight. Um, there's autonomy levels in that competition. So the, the competition's tiered. You can add more and more. You get more points if you add more autonomy. And they deliver, well, originally it was a, a Mars bars and it became an EpiPen. Mm -hmm. um, and this year there was a, a shock meter. So they, um, instead of using real EpiPens, the, they use a, a shock meter that's in a size of an EpiPen. And they have to deliver it to, to Joe to help him. Um, okay, so and, Outback Joe is a crash test dummy sitting somewhere. They've yep. got to locate him first. So with the airborne delivery challenge, we know we're, the, he's in, as I said, it's all line of sight. The big challenge is the medical express challenge. Okay. So he was up to six nautical miles away by line of sight. Okay, so um, delivery line of sight, then medical express, you've got to get something from Outback Joe and collect that. Yeah, correct. So he he is injured or has something, and they need a vial of blood from him. So fully autonomously, you need to send a drone up. It flies a certain waypoint, avoiding some no-fly zones that are in the area that are given to the teams that, that they're not allowed to breach. Mm -hmm. um, and then he, he um, flies to the point where Joe says he is, so I'm here on this farm. And then they have to find the marker that's put out and then mm -hmm. land autonomously near the marker. And then this year, my, I was a judge down at that end. Um, once they land, I would go check the aircraft over and make sure it's good to fly again. These the aircraft, some of them are still running at this point. Um, put the bile of blood in and we hit a button on the aircraft and that sends it back flying and returns all autonomously. There's okay. an extension challenge as well where the um, teams can be thrown through a network connection um, airspace users. So other aircraft might enter the air, the airspace and the aircraft have to autonomously avoid those um, as well. So okay. as they're flying back, they're on their track back, the, the judges will put in a, hang on, there's an aircraft flying in front of you. And that's not by word, that's just through a network. Data link, yeah. Data okay. link, yeah, that the team connect up to. So it simulates yeah. like ADSB data or something else like that. Okay. And then they have to autonomously avoid that as well. So there was up to $75,000 on offer if you could do that. Okay. 
Um, lots of good sponsors, which I'm sure you can mention just before we finish, but let me ask you, right? So the challenge, nobody won the Medical Express challenge this year. No, nah, nobody won. So the first challenge took seven years for someone to complete. And as Jonathan said at, the, at one of the dinners, it's a challenge, not a competition. So a competition, there's going to be a winner each time. This is a challenge, so it's quite hard, and it, we make it harder every year. So no one yeah. won. Some teams got very close this year. So one team did it fully autonomously, but they landed 30 metres away from their target. They had to be within 10. Mm-hmm. And a couple of teams did it within 10. One team landed within four metres, but their return to home didn't work or the auto bit that didn't swap over the GPS location to the autopilot. They had to intervene and press one button. Yeah. That's enough to knock you out. Okay. John, have you got any questions for Mick? Absolutely. Um, I think it's mm-hmm. just a fantastic thing. I'm a big supporter of the challenge. I haven't yep. had the chance to uh, go, but I've watched every one from the beginning. And I might say mm-hmm. how exciting it is that we're doing this in Australia. That's, the, that's the, probably the proudest thing I have. We've yep. got the, the place to do this. And the rest of the world comes here, guys. This is an international event. And if you can, you can go onto, onto um, you know, UAS sites all over the world and the Outback Challenge in Australia is the golden nugget. That's the one you want to be at where you can go, come down here and really push your technology. So the guys have done it well. They've got, you know, obviously uh, about their um, approval to operate beyond visual line of sight within an area that's they set up a TRA so you can do all of that. And it, yep. I mean, I will be there. I'm going to get there one day, hook or by crook, hopefully the next one. My biggest thing was I'd, I'd just come and watch it quite happily. I think it'd be a great thing to see um, being an in industry. But, of course, to fly in it, I'm, I'm probably going to take my high school daughter's uh, up there to go in the high school challenge next time so uh, and have a look myself. You know, one thing I've got, Mick, I wanted to ask about, which was yep. interesting, um, the regulator seems to have been ra- rather, uh, you know, uh, uh, helpful in setting this up. I know there were some stumbling blocks. One of the ones that interested me when I was reading it um, was that yeah, we had a geofenced area and mm-hmm. if the aeroplane flew, if the aircraft flew outside of the geofenced area, it had to terminate the flight autonomously. In, yep. in the flight itself um, yep. instantly. And I believe CASA wanted everyone to demonstrate that. Did, did common sense prevail here? How did that work? So, no, every team needs to demonstrate that they're all, their geofence works. That's 100%. So uh, we do it on the ground. We don't get in the air. So we get oh, the aircraft good. up and running, and then we walk the aircraft over to a section um, that's geofenced, and it needs to shut down. Now, um, over the years, we've changed what, needs to happen and depending on the air vehicle what happens in that flight termination it's up to the teams some punch a shoot um, others just throttle to zero others put in different flight controls it just depends on the, the type of air vehicle you're using we get so many different air vehicles nowadays but the, but when i say flight termination we're talking about here terminating the flight where the aeroplane doesn't uh, might not survive i mean isn't there any common sense for the, the better technology is outside of geofence for the aircraft to to return somewhere to an alternate landing site, or, or so a if point? it's getting to the point where it's at the GF fence, those other set, those other options have already been implemented. Okay, got you. But it has to show that it can. So that uh, yeah, it has yeah. to show that it can do it. Can shut down. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, well, I know. Yeah, remember so that's, the, that's the, the the GF fence is set up at a point where it's uh, the other things. If it's hitting the GF fence, there's other issues. So oh, that's absolutely. our flyaway prevention. Yeah, okay, that's great. Well, I understand it perfectly. I just wanted, um, you know, mm-hmm. there would have been a fairly hefty application for it. Um, yep. But obviously now you've got it running each year. It gets a bit yep. easier and CASA are familiar with it. Um, so you the, know, the a, good thing with this thing. is CASA have been involved and a sponsor of it from the beginning. Um, and, in yep. fact, even some of the people that have been involved in the challenge are now um, from, the, from the beginning have moved across and are with the regulator as our pass inspectors and and yep. I think so. That's one thing. I mean, I remember a year we had Scan Eagle flying around at the challenge um, with CASA there um, and it's circling over the airfield while at Kingaroy Airport. We used to run it out of Kingaroy Airport. We had aircraft coming and going while we had the challenge on. And that's the whole point of the challenge, to integrate yeah. the UAS in the usable airspace. Yep. Yeah, that's great. I think there's, um, you know, I said this uh, at a conference one day and we do talk, I think there's a, a great case to have a permanent area um, like a Woomera, I suppose, in, in Australia. I'd, I'd love every state to have a Woomera 
uh, type. And if, if you're not familiar with what that is, everybody, in the in the 1960s, there was an area in Central Australia where the rest of the world came to test their rockets. Um, they basically just fired them off into the distance. They failed. They crashed. But for um, even today, you can go out to Woomera and scout around and find rocket bits um, lying around the desert <laughs> because it, it, it's fantastic. The William Creek pub has got a whole lot of rockets in the backyard that they've collected and people have found. Uh, rocket parts, but you know ta- that that's certainly something for Australia. I believe uh, it'd be great to host. I know the Americans have some stuff in Nevada, um, but I'd love to see Australia take the lead there and 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 really look at. I mean, the Outback Challenge is a great advertiser for that um, and the way it works. And if the if the application is there and it's possible to have that kind of integration and run run safely, um, you could you know it could be expanded as well. But um, Right now, I reckon out, the Outback Challenge rules, mate. It's a fantastic event. I encourage everybody to, to check it out and, and um, make the trip. Make the trip. Let's you just um, put the link on the screen there. So that link that you can see there is something that Mick provided. Um, it's in the chat, facebook.com slash UAV Challenge Live 2014. Ignore the 2014. That's just when they set it up. So it is actually this year's live footage from the challenge that you can go and have a look at and, um, you know, have a chat to some of the people in that group that may be um, in there participating in the event. What's the next challenge? Tell us about the next one. What are we going to uh, do? We've, we gonna... we've got a meeting in a few weeks where we get to decide that. So um... We're going to pick up Joe or deliver him a small <clears throat> cat or something. <laughs> Pet rescue. Yeah, that, that's where we can go. Pet rescue. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, thanks very much, Mick, for, for being with us today. Yeah. Um, by all means, um, hang around. We've got some other stuff. Um, no but, yeah, Bad stick around on. in the background. Let's have some fun. I will do. Thank you. So moving on, we're going to have a look at our next topic, and uh, everyone's been having a look at the DJI-related stuff. Let's just quickly play the video to start with. And if there's anyone who speaks Chinese in the um, chat room, please do translate. Yeah. Interesting. That's about all we've got in the video content. So someone shot that on a phone. Now, I'm going to make an observation. There's no way that this kind of content would be continuing to be spoon fed out the way it is. You're getting a little bit by little bit. I think we're all. It's market research. It's not, well, it, it, you could say that, but at the end of the day, we're all being DJI's PR machine and doing a good job for them, but I'm happy for that. We can all talk about it. Yeah, look, I, if, if you show that video and and the bulk of people said, oh, I don't think I, I want a removable lens, I'm not interested in that, guess what would be missing on the next Phantom 5? Absolutely. I mean, it's a great, you know, it's a great idea. Com- tech companies are pretty smart and savvy these days at doing this, so they leak something. We saw... But um, according to DJI, RTK. according to them, though, this particular drone is a single built drone for a particular enterprise customer. Yep. There's like only the R- one of them. Like the RTK. And look, why not? These days, you know, um, Mick was hipping me to the, the uh, 3D printer thing. Why not modify a camera? How hard is it? Look, we can screw on the front of it and change the lens on a on a. On a current um, DJI camera, you've got to balance the gimbal, but other than that, it's not rocket science to change a lens on a camera yeah. and, and mill it properly so you can screw it on. Let's, so, um, let's have know. a quick look at the photos. There are photos going around as well. We've yeah, seen look, the video. We saw, we saw the RTK one as well, Greg, you know, um, and interesting to see whether, um, whether you know, what it's going to be. It looks pretty much like the 4 Pro though, doesn't it? Yeah, and just zooming in on that one. So this is the tweet post, certainly, with the, the, the main thing. Ostia LV, just to let everyone know, he has been a, um, a great source of information on Twitter. If you're not already following him, um, go and look him up. Um, you can see that photo. And we've got a bunch of others as well. Let's just move on to the next one. No retractable undercarriage legs or 360 camera or anything like that. That's all silly stuff. Mm. Oh, it looks like a nice camera. I reckon that we're going to see a Hasselblad camera on the next um, Phantom, and it's going to be 24 megapixels. Um, I doubt whether it'll be more. 
but it'll be mm. a 24 megapixel Hasselblad sensor. And um, there you go. My prediction. And there's not much else they need. These are flying cameras, guys. Most people just want the airplane to work and they want a really good camera on it. Um, and that that's that's what's going to sell it. Yeah, absolutely. That looks lovely. Very nice. One particular photo that we'll pause on that I think is coming soon. Not that one. It's coming. One more. One more. That one. Um, yeah, now, look at that. Just, I, I can't zoom in it, on it at the moment from here, but if you can just have a look at the motor cans there, you'll notice that the traditional um, Phantom cans have vent holes in the top. These ones don't. So the rumor is that's going around that they're certainly water resistant, obviously not waterproof because you've still got the lower vents, but rain from above is not going to get into your motors in that particular configuration. Interesting. Yeah. It looks like it's silver um, in colour, which will just very distinguished with a little bit of tone in black. It looks more professional than the white one. It does. It does. And look, lots of other things that we could talk about in there. And, you know, um, I don't want to speculate ad infinitum. A lot of people have been talking about it. But uh, I do like the waterproof. I do like, obviously, the interchangeable lenses um, and the rest we're just going to have to see. Yeah, see what happens. I mean, it's, definitely, uh, definitely zoomable though, based on the number of pins. I think. Yeah. Okay. In that lens configuration, so a interesting. Well, the Mavic's got one. The new Mavic's got one. So why not move that ahead for the Phantom as well? I certainly don't think the Phantom line is dead. No. Um, you know that was speculated a few times. I think that I think they find um, a lot of people just like that platform. You know, I think the old Phantom line is dead in so far as the software they're not going to put the old software on there. The operating no. system, I think, is going to be based on the Mavic. That's, yeah, that's my prediction. that's true. Well, yeah. one of the things that's good about the, the shape, I mean, uh, although it's not as portable as the Mavic 2, and I, I mean, I've got to say, the Mavic 2 is hard to beat um, with those cameras it has. Um, and in terms of its portability, Mavic drivers will tell you any day that, that they've got the best airplane, and they've got a lot of good argument for it. Mm. Um, you know, the, the Phantom, I suppose... Um, is more or less like those customers that just buy a Holden Commodore or a particular type of car and then they get the latest model. They're not going to move. Mm. Um, they like the they like their airplane. They're used to flying it. They know how to operate it. And so there is a lot um, of good, you know, customers that, that will just stay in a line, particularly because they like um, mm. using that. And obviously the familiarity of the software, there's no changes at all. So, they, you know, they're, they're kitted up for it. When we went from Phantom 4 to Phantom 4 Pro, all our batteries still worked. I mean, hallelujah. If these guys keep the Phantom 5 with the same battery that we've been using, we'll be very happy. Those of us a lot of money in battery. Three grand I've got in those batteries. You know, we've got yeah. 10 sitting here and chargers for them all. And I don't want to change that. I don't mind upgrading the airplane. I'll happily, happily do that. Um, if it's the same I, I, form I, factor for the battery, we'll be happy. Um, oh. I don't care if there's newer versions with, that are longer. You know, those are the kind of things we expect with incremental upgrades. Yeah, well, we want to use our current batteries. We want to. We don't want to change. And I think I hope DJ get that message um, to the point. You know, where they can sell a whole lot of new batteries. Yes, I'll have to buy another ten. You know, if I need ten to do the job. So mm. I, yeah, I have to buy another ten. But I tell you what, if you're going to buy another 10, I hope that DJI learned the message that they need to include batteries with DJI Care for the Phantom series. So if you do have an accident with your Phantom and you've got DJI Care and your battery is damaged, you don't get it replaced, just in case you didn't know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's the way it currently is, not covered. Yeah. Okay, look, thanks. Uh, that's been interesting to look at. We're going to move on because we've still got a fair bit of content today. <laughs> We've um, last week said, let's um, have a look at some videos for our viewers to send in flying over water. And we've got a couple of those here today. The first one is from Yowie P51. He's a guy that I met out at um, Wanda Beach a little while back. Let's chuck that up. Windy. Oh yeah, that's a happening day. So on this particular day, it is very, very windy. I can um, see it. His comments in the video, flying remote control in high wind and unpleasant arvo at the beach, unless you're into the wind. 
Uh, so yeah. flying fixed wing, um, that's his style. That's cool. But a lovely area. It's howling. <laughs> you can just tell from the horizon. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, you're in the tilt. <laughs> There's some more content there. We've got another one from um, from the same creator. We're just going to switch over to that one. Now this one's titled um, Two Hard Pilots. Um, kite flyers and two hard pilots in 25 to 30 knot wind flying bareback. Oh yeah, look at that. And when you're flying over those kites, just remember that they jump <laughs> a yeah. long way, a long way. But if you fly upwind of them, um, you won't have as much problem. They won't definitely uh, don't go straight into wind. So that's the secret there. You fly downwind of them. Well, wow, it's really windy, isn't it? Yeah, he, he flies out there a lot of wonder and um, yeah, some good footage I've seen from him. After the show's over, I'm going to put um, the competition um, channel links. I haven't put them in there yet in the description, but I'll throw them in there later so you can check out other videos from these great creators. Next one, we've got something from... Um, now, Zeb Meat sent me the link, but the channel name is owned by Mike Green. Let's have a look at this one. I was getting seasick there for a minute. <laughs> Nice. And what you're going to see about that great shot is the reveal, of course, guys. Whenever you're backing up like that and you've planned it, it's a lovely way to reveal um, the location. And as you see, the ocean coming in the background, everything. Always an interesting shot um, for those of you that are, um, you know, new cinematographers. Uh, rather than zooming in, zoom, out, zoom back and, and out. And also from Zeb Meat. Um, this was in a Mavic Pro, his first backward um, flight at St. George. Same again. Here inland. we go. Revealing the trees as you fly backwards. Beautiful. Lovely way, to, lovely way to show a shot. Nice and close there. You can see the prop wash. Good and job. Then, and then the last one. This one's absolutely gorgeous. Um, He's titled it No Hand of Man. Fun to fly with no structures visible. And the footage here has got some really beautiful reflections. Yeah, look at that. So um, in terms of something to ask for, for an interesting challenge for next week, for people to send in out of their archives, some photos or some videos where you've got some water reflection. Really beautiful shots. Love to see some more of that. I've got my uh, Murray River one, which has um, turned out really nice. I forget <clears> what I call that. Remember, I got the car ferry. That's got a great reflection. It, it is interesting, isn't it? It's just just paints a nice shot, a nice dimension mm. reflection. Yeah. Upon reflection. Upon reflection. And we've got a, a late entry that came from Steve um, of Magnetic Island. We don't have that, it. That's pretty. No. Very I, nice. So the video from Steve, for whatever reason, is not in the playlist. I did download it, but maybe I forgot to put it in. My bad. Steve, I'll yep. throw yours in next week, so apologies for that. And another quick, another yeah. quick tip for the, um, for the young cinematographer. You can set on your DJI aircraft and your DJI Go 4 app, you can set grid lines onto, um, the, the pay, onto your screen. Now, they're always really handy to have. Uh, professional photographers use them just when they're framing. But most importantly, to get the horizon level, a bolt straight horizon is, is absolutely um, necessary um, for a shot. You never want a kilted horizon at all. And the list, the um, viewer doesn't necessarily notice it, but subconsciously, um, when they Something's notice, just not quite right. Not quite on level. So what you do, you plan your shot. Now, obviously, in the wind, it's going to affect it. But if you can, you can set up to make sure you've got that horizon level, and then look at the colour balance between the sky and the water. This is for water shooting. So you've got the two different types of blues or perhaps a blue and a green, and you can actually um, work your exposure to bring out 
those those two colours particularly as you're going. And then have a look first, then go and plan the, the shot movement once you've got the exposure and the uh, horizon level. There you go. Yeah. I just had um, a question from Ken on the screen. Who sounds more American, um, John or Greg? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, Ken, we'll be coming down to you a little bit later there, Sunshine. <laughs> no, That's I can't good. do it. <laughs> That's very south. <laughs> uh, anyway, moving right along. So, Steve, I'll, ch I'll throw up your Magnetic Island one next week. My apologies for that. It was a late one. I only got it this morning. Um, so out of those videos, um, definitely um, the the reflection one, Zeb Meat, No Hand of Man, is my pick for... I'm going yep. to send you a prize. You're going to get a tube of Vegemite. So, Zeb Meat, send me an email later, the the wonderful Aussie prize, and I think I'm going to have to contact Vegemite for a sponsorship deal. Ah, that's all right. Look, any leftover I'll happily have here. Yeah, absolutely. We, we use it for diff oil. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. We've got... It's that time of day, Oz videos. We've got our pack that's been put together. And just to quickly thank our editor, Greg Hilton, just thank you very, very much for doing that each and every week. That's Go absolutely you, Greg. awesome. Yep. So let's, um, let's play. So starting out here, this one is from Paul Van Bielen. Um, he got lucky with some wind conditions at George Westra. Um, oh, sorry, and George Westra was the last one just before the sunset. He took an opportunity to get the drone out and film for about 30 minutes. That's windy too, man. That's yeah. Some good, that's some good work right there, that wind. Just, he loves just, filming in golden hour time. And for those people who, you know, may not have heard that term, golden hour is obviously the last or the first hour of the day. Um, this is filmed at Jaroa, which is um, a coastal town in the municipality of Kiama, um, in the Illawarra region of New South Wales, Australia. And it's 133 kilometers south of Sydney, close to Jeringong, Kiama and Berry. Beautiful area. Yeah, it is. Wow, fantastic. And and right now you can see why too, having um, when you have a two operator thing doing this, we've got a camera operator and the pilot, because what we're watching here is probably the one person doing the job. Oh, that's nice. Good job. Right in the centre there for a while. That was good. It's hard work. It and is it hard work. Lot, takes lots of practice to do this, guys. Uh, particularly a fast moving subject, um, you know, keeping it centre. Uh, you can't really use active track here in that environment because of the water. Yeah. Next, we've got something from Oz Beach Andy, one of our regulars. So this is from Iron Knob in South Australia. It's a funny place name. Um, it's a town in South Australia in the Air Peninsula, immediately south of the Air Highway. Very, yeah. very small population, 199 people living there um, in 2006 was the census data. Um, it's a pretty much a perfect example of the changing fortunes of mining towns. There was a time when Iron Knob and um, a nearby town were a lot more productive than they are now. And they had a population of 3,000 workers, all employed by BHP at the time. It's a semi-desert area. Um, annual rainfall is um, pretty awful, as you can probably guess. Um, 200 millimetres per year. It's 50, 54 kilometres from Wyala um, and the, close to the Spencer Gulf region. And um, by the way, just a background comment, Mick Malloy has got some Vegemite on the other camera. He's going to eat it on screen for us before and we go today. A, a teaspoon. He's got, he's got a he, teaspoon. He's probably 3D printed it as well. Is we'll, that put that, we'll put that up in a couple, just at the end of the video section. There, there are some, um, where do I get up to? There's um, a lot of closed up shops in the area, as you can probably imagine, but there's a pretty resilient population who want to keep that town alive. Moving on, we've got Narican Falls. Um, this was by Steve Pilcher. Steve's um, got another video a little bit later, but this one was um, on oh, a Sunday afternoon. The falls are located about 10 to 12 kilometres south from the Prince's Highway in the Latrobe Valley region. 
The falls are sourced from the Narrican Creek, which rises in the hills northwest of Thorpedale and eventually joins the Latrobe River near Narrican. The falls can be accessed via a walking path um, of about 50 metres, so only a short walk from the car park, which um, leads to the base of the falls. There's um, car and coach parking and picnic tables and fireplaces and all of that kind of good stuff, so definitely a lovely day out there. I've got to edit. I've got I've got a, um, some waterfalls in um, the Philippines that I got to edit together one day. Yeah, I love yeah. Filming. It's, it's, I remember you did some stuff out there. I did some fly. I did some flying in Maui um, a couple of years ago and, and got some great water stuff there too. It was really interesting. Mm. Um, flying around that island as well. Unfortunately, the surf wasn't enough. I really wanted to catch some pipeline surfers. Yeah. Um, I mentioned everybody's there with the aircraft when those, the waves are on. I've got to start using um, my polar polarizing filters a little bit Ab now. I've only, yeah, I've only had them for a little while, but it's just that one extra step. I put, I remember to put it on, but sometimes forget to actually adjust it before I get up in the air. Yeah, look, an ND filter is an easy, quick and easy non-polarizing ND filter. Yeah. It's always good to just throw up some um, some better, um, you know, quality stuff. It just just manages the light, you know. Um, pe photographers often tell me, you know, there's so much light in and in, in, um, in aerial photography that they're not used to dealing with them. And you here's can... here's just oh, to interrupt look you. That. Look at that reflection. This one's from Glass Bottom Films. Um, this one is um, a DJI Phantom 3, so the older drone's still doing pretty good, um, oh, shooting yeah. some sunrises in Western Australia. Um, his comment here, with all the fuss about the new Mavic 2, it's easy to forget that the older DJI drones are still incredibly capable machines. Spot on. Yeah. Spot on. Here's some relaxing footage shot of Perth, Western Australia. Um, some incredible sunrises filmed with a Phantom 3 Advanced, and that was from Glass Bottom Films. Fantastic. <clears throat> I do have to get to Western Australia one time. I've been there a couple of times years ago when I was much younger, um, just in transit. That's my whole Western Australia exposure, um, catching a plane back then to South Africa, but um, I'm no, going to have to get out. Yeah, it's a good spot, man. You love it. Very good. So as always, if you've got some videos that you'd like to um, come in the show, send them to upload at gregkunert.com. I'll put that on the screen in a little while. But certainly um, Greg's included a fair bit from this one. We've got each, each week, we kind of keep about nine minutes of footage. We've got a little bit more here. You know, I've got that out of order. I definitely got that out of order. So here's what I'm going to do. When I spoke about glass bottom films, that's this one. The previous one was by Colby Smith. Sorry about that, guys. I'm going to tell you about the previous one now that I've got it. So the drone footage from the Kimberley region traveling um, the Gibb River in July 2018. That river was originally constructed in the 60s to transport cattle from outlying stations to ports of Derby and Wyndham. It's a 660 kilometer trail. Wow. Um, it's four wheel drive, and it's the best way to discover the natural treasure, the Kimberley's wild heartlands, turning off the bitumen and going west over the range um, on the Gibb River Road is a truly unique Aussie outback adventure through the Kimberley's vast untouched wilderness um, you've got some gorges, some cat cattle stations, the size of small countries. A lot of people in other parts of the world just don't understand how big Australia is. And just one cattle station is bigger than many countries. We love doing that, don't we? we got, i got a ranch the size of Belgium. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that road connects you to Winjana Gorge, Tunnel Creek, Leonard Gorge, Bell Gorge, Galvin's Gorge, Manning Gorge, the Drysdale River Station, Home Valley Station, and El Cuestro Wilderness Park. So that was the previous video. Sorry for getting them around the wrong way. But um, 
Yeah, if you do want to do that though, you'd need to go and hire a four wheel drive and put two weeks aside, definitely. It's not a, a, a trip for the faint hearted. So Mick, we're coming up to the end of that video and now just for our friends, we're gonna to have to get you to get some Vegemite out. Do the Vegemite challenge, man. Forget the UAV challenge. You got the Vegemite challenge. This is particularly for Ken who wimped out and didn't eat it. So Vegemite. Oh, there you go, man. Yeah, go hard, Mick. Look at this. Oh yeah. Full screen. Hang on. Full screen. That, Full screen. Get that puppy in there. That's right. That's that's Vegemite. Mm. Yeah, yep. Okay. Ken, Ken, you just put it on your taste buds, mate. You gotta go and stick it in. Come on, get it into yeah. you. Get it into you, mate. Oh, another great. spoon. Look at that. Look, Look at that. Go there. Go hard. <laughs> Beautiful. That's right. Man. Good point. We in, in Australia, we went straight from bottle to Vegemite. We did. I swear. They put Vegemite yeah, on the bottle. They put, yeah, exactly. That's right. They put it on the bottle. I go to school and I had Vegemite sandwiches every day. But you know what? Just to share with you, it's something about the way your mum does it. I have Vegemite and, you know, my wife's making breakfast for me some days and she's putting Vegemite toast there. But today I went and had brekkie at mum's place and she, she did some Vegemite toast and it was just the perfect butter and Vegemite combination. Yeah, that's it, man. Well, you know, we bookend our lives with it. You have it when you're a baby, you have Vegemite on toast. Your grandmother or your mother gives it to you when you're sick. <laughs> and then when you end up in a nursing home, guess what they start giving you? Vegemite, Vegemite. On, toast, <laughs> on toast. And you're back in nappies on Vegemite. I mean, it's just wonderful. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah. Anyway, we've got um, one last section of the show today, um, which, you know, we've got some really, really good submissions from some of our viewers today. Let's just throw some of these up. So the first one... Um, is from Stephen, and we saw some content from him um, a few moments ago. He was doing the Narrican Falls, but we've also got a koala. Let's have a look at this. A flying koala? Not a flight, well. Koala doesn't care at all, does he? Look, what's that thing? Get that out of my face. So Stephen basically says this is a close-up of mum and toddler koalas in the front yard. So obviously he's not living in the inner city. Um, they, they have been regular visitors for years now, feasting on some large Nikolai gum. There's also the teenager asleep on the other side of the tree. That's but typical. <laughs> Look, typical is absolutely right. My producer over here, other than when she does this show, is going to be asleep for the rest of the day. Yeah. Or looking at her iPhone, one or the other. Hey, great, aren't they? I just thought this is so appropriate to share for our international viewers. Beautiful, beautiful part of Australia. He looks like he's tucked into the trees there too, but oh, nice, nice way to do it. Look at the karate scratching himself. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about the aircraft at all. Yeah. Very nice. And moving on from there, and moving on from there, we've got something else now. So Micro Mondays. This is something happening in Melbourne. Let's just chuck that up. Sorry for that. I've just turned down the audio because I know that that one's got a copyright tune in it. But... Um, these people, um, so Micro Mondays, they got Tiny Whoop Meets in Melbourne, Australia um, every Monday, and it's in a car park there. Um, again, I'll put the link to this in the description after the show. So at the Webb Street car park there. For those of you, has anyone in the chat room just out of interest been flying Tiny Whoops? Nice little aircraft. And we'll play the next one straight away no, as well. I haven't seen that. You haven't seen the whoops? I haven't seen a whoops. What's a whoop? <coughs> They're really, really tiny micro aircraft. And um, oh. there's, a, there's a guy, a helicopter, who's um, an occasional viewer of our channel. He's got a great channel where he's doing tiny whoop flying around his home and he's gone and set up obstacles and gates yeah. and things. Okay, and Ch chat room, please. Oh, there's a, 
Okay, here we go. Get on your whoop on. Yeah. So this is one of the videos um, from a Monday night session in the car park. Here we what go. Are we, what are we talking about? A hundred grams or less? Um, let me Google the weight of a whoop. Oh, cool. Nice flying. 30 grams. Really? 30 yeah. grams? This is someone with his with a camera and a battery is 30 grams. Wow. That was the first one I came up with. So really, really tiny. But they have so much fun through these courses and these gates. And, you know, they're doing it every Monday in Melbourne. So anyone in Melbourne encourage you to go and check it out. Again, yeah, I'll, I'll update the video descriptions with all of these um, channel links afterwards for the viewer videos. And I've got so, one more that we're going to cut to in just a moment. 30 grams, hey? Absolutely tiny. I did, a, I did a big run in the Tello yesterday, and I've got a, a range extender on it now um, with a Wi-Fi. Um, you know, you can, you can bridge across a Wi-Fi network or a booster. Mm -hmm. And it, I was just continually impressed with it, now, 89 grams. And uh, I just love it. The, the photos it takes, I, I, I just, one of my favorite airplanes. Yeah. So let's just move on. We've got one more quickly. We've had D1 store stuff here before, and this is inside a shopping center in Melbourne. You've actually got this building inside the shopping center. It was an old building that they built the shopping center around. And um, it used to be a jean store, if I remember correctly, last time I was in Melbourne. But um, D1 stores now moved in and um, selling some good stuff there. Where's that? Um, I'll get the address and I'll chuck it up in the chat. Well, what city I'm in? Melbourne. Oh, great. Cool. Very nice. It's in Latrobe Street, Melbourne, in Melbourne Central. Okay. D1. Whoa, what was that? No one else heard it except for you. I pulled the volume down. Oh, good. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I nearly lost my head. <laughs> oh, that was a big sneeze. I pulled the volume down, but you and um, my producer over there. And yeah, made me jump. And, and you. Ouch. <laughs> Okay. Oh, and and by the way, I've got to add, Mel the Phantom Trucker is here as well. Mel sits on my iPhone now. This is something new, so that if something goes wrong in the middle of the show, like there's no audio going out, um, Mel's there to go and he, he's definitely the Phantom. Are you there, Mel? I'm waiting for him. Ah, next time. But he said I heard it. <laughs> He's there. Yeah. He <laughs> now, heard it. For those that don't know, Mel's the guy who puts the stuff up on the screen, the chat comments. Thank you for everything you do, Mel. It's very much appreciated. And we've reached that time of the show where we've got some community service announcements. Let me just put a couple of those up. So number one, a few people have been asking the question about... Drain camp. <laughs> I've got to make a slide about that, haven't I? Yeah, check out. No, you do yours first and I'll mention it. Okay, so upload at gregkunert.com. If you want to share your videos on next week's show, that's where you send it to. Now, I've got one big ask of everyone here, and I meant to say it at the beginning, but I forgot to do it. So we're on YouTube, tw um, Twitter, and Facebook. So here's the ask. When we put up the video for next week, share that video link in Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and what have you to your friends, trying to grow. And the channel at the moment, our number last week was 703 or 704, and we went backwards from there to 699. So a few people got unsubscribed. Thank you, YouTube, for the wonderful things that you do. But today, we've gone back up to 703. <laughs> Good. So... Why is it important to hit a bigger number? I want to hit a thousand. It's the magic target by which time you're a YouTube partner and bad things don't happen and it just works a lot better. Um, 
So that's my birthday present from you. My birthday present that I want is to hit a thousand by 19th of November. Don't want anything else. Help, help get us to that number. Moving on from there, John, you have drone camp. Yes. Check it out. We're not running it next year. It'll be uh, a fantastic opportunity. If you're a high school student or you have a uh, son or daughter or cousin or whatever in high school age, dronecamp.info is the website everybody dronecamp.info and check it out um, it's going to be fantastic you'll get a tello as part of your um, uh, camp and uh, you'll come along to the sydney sport and rec center and we'll be doing all sorts of stuff night flying search and rescue missions uh, programming you'll do ground course in robotics uh, meteorology navigation and rotorcraft theory of flight it'll be a full-on three days um, exposure to all the technology, um, fixed wings. Uh, we've got a large twin fixed wing. We're going to have some um, powered lift there, some vertical takeoff stuff. Everything's going to happen at Drone Camp next October. So just check it out. Keep it there. Put it in your diary. And, um, and how was that for a quick slide? Mate, that was fantastic. That was really good. Faster than, a speeding, faster than and, a speeding bullet. And spread the word, everybody. We'd love to have it um, and maybe take it to your town too as well. So once we've run the first one, lovely, lovely. Thanks, Greg. Okay. Look, I've reached the end of my list of things for the day. Is there anything else you've got, John? No, I'm good. I'm out of here. I'm going back. I've got the cub fixed in the background here. Rebuilt all the front end of it. By the um, way, just for everyone's benefit, this is John's hangar. Just pick up the camera and just quickly. Oh, yeah, here we go. Here's the hangar. I, I don't want to show you some of the, uh, the the wrecks that are going on at the moment. Hang on. Wait. Uh, there you go. So this is the Cub. Um, you can see that there. That's lovely. That's a uh, not just a four-channel radio control. And over here, you've got more and more fuselages lying on the ground. We've got a, a large Tundra uh, missing the front end up there with Vampire on the roof. Uh, you see that? Yeah, De Havilland Vampire. Uh, we've got quads lying around and all over the place. Here's one of our other robots. This is one of our custom builds. Can you see that? Oh, hang on. Uh, there we go. Yeah, that's a that's a, a 500 frame uh, with all sorts of goodies in it that we um, we do all sorts of stuff with um, Pixhawk. And while I'm mentioning that, the Pixhawk have been um, uh, re-released again. So we've got one of those. Make sure you grab your Pixhawk folks while they're in stock because uh, they get they get out of stock really quick. We go up the back. Uh, you can see our cases, more aeroplanes charging. Here we got up the back here, we've got our charging desk, and you can see uh, all the lipos are stored on bricks uh, in an area here that's all fireproof and um, our charging desk and so forth. Uh, and the all-important uh, fridge um, stocked with beer, uh, of course. For post-flight. Ah, yes, that's right, for after. So that's Eight pretty hours much bottle it. to throttle. And there's the, uh, can you see there, there's our um, there's our hanger sign outside the door, skunk book. Yep. Lovely. Well, there you go. There's a quick tour of the hangar uh, up here in Newport, um, basically just full of anything that flies. Okay. I heard you were full of it. Mick, before we go, is there anything yeah, else you wanted it. to add? I'm full of it. No, no, I'm good. Just enjoyed your show. Thank you again for having me on and um, follow the challenge. We look to always want to get more teams involved. Um, yeah, it's a great thing. So the main challenge is every two years. The high school challenge is every year. Okay. When, when's the next one, Mick? Give it another plug. When's the next challenge, the high school one? So high school challenge is September 2019 and the main challenge will be uh, September 2020. Okay. September so 2020. For, I'm going to um, be there. For all the Aussies here, and, and in and fact, I, I, anyone yeah. around the world, go and go and speak to your um, teachers at, or your um, deputies and leaders at your school. Ask them, are they interested in coming to Australia for the Drone Challenge, for the UAV Challenge? Really, really so it's good interesting. stuff. This, this year we had only two Australian teams. The rest of the teams were from overseas in the high school challenge. Normally it's the other way around, but this year mostly overseas teams. So we want some more Aussie teams to get back into it. Aussie, Aussie, yeah. Aussie. Maybe we can get a drone camp team up. That'd be cool. I got to work That'd on that. That'd be a good, good, good thing. So we get yeah, a team. yeah, we're gonna have sixty kids there. Maybe we can do a big uh, challenge. Have a drone camp. Get up there. Some of it. Maybe I can come down and uh, talk about the challenge while it's on, even. Well, absolutely, man. That you're welcome to. That'd be great. Fantastic. Mm. Okay. Awesome. Look, thank you, Mick, for coming. Thank you, John. Thank you to everyone in the chat room. As always, have a great time. Have a great time flying, and we'll see you next week. Bye for now. Happy landing. Safe flying, everybody. See ya.